let's talk about this today. And um, just a few words about myself, if I can switch the slides. Here it is. Yeah, you already know this. I, I'm a software developer in, in the dark old days, but now I'm in application security. I do have some certs, but for what it's worth, I am not a hardware hacker and I've never been one. But So how did I get into this jungle? Well, let's talk first about the common perception. Uh, a lot of people think that application security and IoT are two separate domains with nothing in common. But is that really the case? Let's consider this screenshot. This is a web application in my browser. And many of you might know this application is Juice Shop, which is pretty awesome. I highly recommend you playing with it. And uh, it's, it's web app. It runs somewhere on some kind of machine, maybe in a Docker container, maybe on a laptop or on a server in the cloud. Um, and on this screenshot, there is also a web application in the browser. But in this case, it's coming from a tiny device, which happens to be my home router. But for the end user, like me, is there really, really a difference between the two? Both are showing up in the browser. Both serve me, serve me some um, HTML and JavaScript. And that's how I interact with these two systems. So um, not really a difference. In terms of requirements, both the application in its classic sense and the device probably need a CPU and some memory so they can function. Uh, they should probably be connected to a network. Otherwise, they might be quite useless. And they should have an operating system, right? and maybe some services and libraries and programming language and software developers who use these programming language or languages and libraries to build awesome things that we all use. In terms of security, we are all familiar with OWASP top 10, right? We're not gonna go through this list, don't worry. And there's also this more recent thing called IoT top 10. And although these two lists are not necessarily uh, the same, there is quite a bit of correlation and intersection between the two. But for the sake of this presentation, I'd like to focus on just the two items on the right side. So the insecure network services in IoT Top 10 cover the software that runs on the device and insecure ecosystem interfaces covers the software that runs elsewhere outside of the device, but it's part of the greater IoT ecosystem. So these two things are basically our classic, well, applications in, in their classic sense. And as applications, they can have all of these OWASP top 10 issues and maybe even more. So the proper Venn diagram should look like this at least from the attacker's perspective. Um, think about it. If you're an attacker and you want to um, attack a device, you can do it through many different vectors. One of them happens to be software that runs on the device. All right, let me tell you a story. Who remembers March 2020, first of all? Of course, we all do. That's when we got into the pandemic mode and uh, we got into lockdowns and many organizations and companies started closing their doors. And some of them started looking into alternative ways of uh, staying connected with their customers and their friends. And some of these organizations looked into what we call live streaming, meaning broadcasting video and audio over the internet. So I happened to volunteer one of the nonprofits to help them with their live streaming setup. They had none, and uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll help you guys. I have no idea what I'm doing, but we'll figure it out. Um, well, live streaming actually is pretty simple. You have your video signal or signals, and you have your audio signals, um, and they could, be, they could come from the same device, like camera with microphone, or they could be separate. And what many people do is they run a computer with some special broadcasting software like OBS, and the software processes the signals. You can apply different effects um, and, and whatnot. And it generates um, a properly a stream in, in, in certain format. 
like H.264 is a popular one. And that's, that digital stream gets pushed to one or several of these uh, cloud streaming services. And the end users connect to the services and watch whatever you have to present. That's pretty cool uh, and simple. But the people at that nonprofit that I was helping are not were not necessarily technically savvy. And this computer with this heavy software in the middle was um, a single point of failure for them, really. Like they would have to maintain this computer, make sure it's updated, know how to run OBS, uh, try not to delete necessary files by mistake. So I thought, is there something that I can replace this computer with that's uh, easy to use and maintenance-free? And the answer is yes. So I did some research and I found these hardware encoders and they were not super expensive. So I just went ahead and bought one. Um, so this device has audio input and HDMI input, and it has Ethernet port. So it's, of course, it's connected to, to the internet. Uh, and it has a web UI where I could set different parameters like the video size, bitrate, and I could also specify which service to stream to. In this case, it was YouTube. So I set it up, I connected everything, and it worked like a charm. It was, it was doing exactly uh, what it was supposed to do. And I, don't, I didn't need that computer with OBS anymore. Uh, by the way, this is the final setup. So I had a simple mixer board with four microphone inputs. I had to split HDMI, HDMI signal because I had a, um, an extra monitor. And this box right here with these two lights is the actual encoder. The beauty of this setup is it's, uh, all these devices are connected to a single power strip and you turn it on or off with a flip of a switch. Super easy, anybody can do it. So everybody's happy that's the end of story. Uh, no, of course not. Um, <laughs> we have uh, 50 more minutes. So I was not like, I was pretty happy with the, with the setup, but I was not super happy with color balance that, that was coming from the camera that I was using. Um, the lighting conditions were changing all the time. It could be light from the window. It could be overcast, sunny. It could be artificial light. So the camera handled some of the auto color, color balance, but not uh, perfectly. So I thought, is there a way to adjust color balance in the device, in, in the encoder? So I opened the advanced settings in that web UI, and I looked through all these settings. I have no idea what they do, and there's no documentation. But I didn't see one that would say like auto color balance or even like having presets. So then I thought, well, okay, maybe the software that runs on this encoder has some functionality that is not exposed through the web UI. And I decided to take a look inside the device. And literally I opened the cover and I looked at the board and I remember I'm not a hardware hacker, so I don't really know what to do with this. And there was no port here that would say, uh, or label that would say connect here for a free shell. So um, I decided to close the box and approach it as a software appliance. Um, and software appliance is a computer that runs some software. So I did a uh, port scan with Nmap and I found uh, HTTP, of course, RTSP, RTMP, ATMP. These are all video streaming protocols. And I also saw that Telnet was open. So of course, immediately I tried to log in and, and uh, I failed because I didn't know the password. And I tried a few obvious ones like root admin and none of them worked. So this was a dead end. But I also noticed in the web UI, in the firmware update section, there was also firmware backup and of course, I pushed this button and I got the file pushed to me, uh, which is RAR. And RAR is it's basically ar archive format. It's like a zip. And this RAR file was unencrypted and I was totally able to unpack it and see the contents of the firmware on this device. So this was super easy. 
uh, pretty cool. And uh, first of all, of course, I, I looked at configuration files like this one and this one, and I look, look through directories looking for the setting that I wanted, but I didn't find one. So I just started analyzing like what exactly is happening here, how it works. And this file right here, box.view400 underscore HDMI is the largest file on um, in this set. It's six and a half megabytes and it reports as a binary executable. Um, and it doesn't look like any standard utility like PNG to BMP, RAM serial uh, or anything like that. So I thought this is probably my guess it's probably the this custom software that runs on the device. All right, cool, that's progress, but I still want a shell on the device. And I noticed that the firmware also had the password file. What? Okay, let's take a look at the password file. Um, this is a standard Linux password format and had the password hash. And I tried to crack it, I gave it a few, um, word list, but I couldn't find a match. So this was more complicated than I thought. <laughs> it's not one of those obvious password one to three uh, things. So I then I had a brilliant idea. Like, I don't have to crack this password. What I can do instead, I can replace this password file with my own, push this firmware back to the device and see if I can get into Telnet. Uh, or into a shell using Telnet. So I used OpenSSL password command to generate a password hash. Um, I repackaged the RAR archive, pushed it to the device, rebooted it, and I was in with my own password. Awesome. Now I'm root on the device, I'm in the shell, and it runs some kind of Linux. So it runs Linux, which is custom version from High Silicon. What is High Silicon? So High Silicon happens to be Chinese manufacturer who specialize in video surveillance devices. And it's a subsidiary of Huawei. Uh, okay, cool. What else? I looked at the open ports on the device with Netstat and my suspicion was correct. This box executable was actually the workhorse that handled everything, pretty much everything. Video streaming, uh, HTTP, and a bunch of other things. Cool. Uh, I looked at the password, um, at the process list, and I was able to quickly uh, reverse engineer their boot sequence. So they had a couple of custom scripts like load and run, which would do some preparatory work. And then they would start this executable, which would stay running as long as the device is powered on. So I went ahead and modified this script. So when I reboot the device, I don't have the application running. And I did this because I wanted to play with it. Now, I have to tell you that at this point, when I got this deep into the device, I was no longer interested in looking for that color balance setting, to be honest. Um, I, being a, um, I guess being a security professional, I thought, well, maybe instead I should try to hack and look for vulnerabilities in this device. And that's exactly what I started doing. So let me show you how uh, this device looks. Here's one of them. Um, yeah, you see it's, it's pretty small and neat. And I can show you the inside. Mm, nothing exciting. And again, we're not hacking hardware today. So I'm just gonna close it and we're going to play with this as a black box. It's box and it's black. Um, I need to connect it to the network, plug in the Ethernet cord and give it some power. And it shines a, shines a blue light, which means it's powered on. And I'm gonna set it aside and not touch it again because we are not doing physical hacking. Okay, it respond, responds to the ping. So I can turn that to it now. And I'm in. When I go to TMP directory, I can see all the contents that we have seen on the screenshot before with all, this, uh, all the software and configuration files. 
And now I can run the program itself. So I started this box executable, and as you can see, it prints a lot of useful information on the console, which would be pretty helpful when we try to debug it. OK, what else do I need? Of course, I need a browser. So here is my browser that I'm going to use to work with this encoder. Of course, it prompts me for user ID and password. Uh, my user ID is admin, and password is secret. As the page loads, you can see that the console shows a lot of debug information. Um, again, it's very helpful. It's basically showing me all the files that it's serving to my browser. OK, um, I'm, I'm in. Now, what else do I need? Since this is a, as a web application, I want to intercept HTTP requests and responses and analyze them. I like Burp Suite, so that's what I have set up here. Uh, here are all the requests that were sent by my browser. And um, let me turn off images and hide the unimportant stuff. OK, uh, here is the front page. The first try was unsuccessful, unauthorized, of course, because um, it was before I entered my credentials. The second was OK, and it had the authorization header with uh, username admin, and it's digest authentication. In this case, the password is not sent in the plain text. Um, and there are some there are some calls that uh, are done by the UI, and this one is interesting. It returns some settings, including the administrative password in plain text. Okay, well, um, maybe it's not a big deal because it's all authenticated, so nobody can get this. But we'll see how we can use it later. Um, cool. Now, what else do I need? Since this is a binary, it would be helpful to somehow decompile it so we can look at the code and not at the um, a bunch of uh, binary code, right? So um, I tried this tool called Ghidra. It was released by NSA a couple of years ago. And uh, I always wanted to give it a try, but never had a chance to. And I thought this was perfect opportunity for me to learn this tool. So I downloaded it, I gave it, I pointed it to this um, binary executable, and it processed it for a few minutes and gave me this complete disassembly um, on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it also gives me a decompiled code corresponding to this assembly. So decompile looks like C code. And I, I've done a lot of C programming in the past. So this, this is great. I can totally read it, except that function names and variable names make no sense. So that's something that uh, we'll need to figure out, right? Um, OK, so what are we doing now? Now we're basically doing application security assessment. And for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to be switching back and forth between different windows. And I apologize if, if it gives you motion sickness. Don't blame me for that, please. And also, if demos don't work, uh, blame demo gods, not me again. Um, but what we're going to do together is we're going to find backdoor password, uh, path traversal leading to un unauthenticated file disclosure. We're going to find two remote code executions via through different vectors. And we're also going to find denial of service through buffer overflow. I hope it sounds exciting. And uh, let's do it. So when we are doing application security assessment, we have to ask ourselves a question. What are the critical functions in this application? And the first one that normally comes to mind is the authentication, right? Because it's like your front door that has to be uh, pretty strong and unbreakable. So this application supports authentication. And I know that the username is always admin. I could not change it, and I didn't see it in configuration files. So it must be hard-coded somewhere. Ghidra lets you search for strings. And that's what I did. I just searched for admin, 
and I found exactly one occurrence of the string admin in this binary. And this string was referenced from a couple of functions. And here is one of them. This function accepts two parameters. And the first parameter is first compare it to admin. Okay, so this does look like authentication. And then the second parameter is compared to what? So when I first saw that, I was like, where is this coming from? Is this something that I entered by accident? No, it's actually something that's hard coded in this binary. And if there is a match, the function returns one, which, is, which means authentication is successful. If not, it proceeds with checking actual password right here. So when I saw this, I immediately thought, this looks like, like a backdoor. And I just decided to give it a try. So I'm going to use a curl command to issue a request to the application. And of course, if I don't specify any credentials, I get error 401. But if I specify username and this string as the password, it succeeds. So now I'm served this HTML. But remember that get sys function, that works too. And this one actually returns the, the actual administrative password. So again, this is something that an attacker could send to my device and get all, all, all the data, including the actual password and log in through the web interface and do whatever they want. So that's an issue number one, backdoor. Um, also, it appears that some of the vendors used the same password for Telnet, as I later figured out. Um, that's another issue, another kind of like a backdoor. OK, let's rename uh, this function so we can, because we know that it takes care of authentication, at least some of the authentication, and see where it's called from. So here you can see that it's called from this function and it's called twice from this one. So let's double click here. And uh, this function is actually processing HTTP request. So I'm going to rename this to box process request. This is not a very big function. It's uh, about 300 lines in this C code. So, but it's kind of critical, right? It's like whatever is dealing with HTTP request and it's calling authentication when needed and does other thing. So I decided to just do a, the complete code review for, um, for this code. And I, I, as I was looking through the code, trying to understand what exactly is happening, I saw this big if statement. Uh, which was comparing a variable against some of these strings. And um, I followed the logic and I realized that if there is a match with one of these strings, then the file that matches this pattern is, can be served without authentication. Well, uh, that's okay, it's not a big deal because all of these are static files and they don't have any sensitive information. So it's okay to serve them uh, to the requester without authentication. So let's play around with this a little bit. I'm going to go to burp and send this, uh, not this one, sorry, but the other one, the one with authentication to repeater. I'm going to remove all the unnecessary headers. Uh, it works because it has authorization header. Now let me remove authorization header. And now it fails, but let me in the URL specify uh, type one of the HTML files that is on the device. And now it returns that file to me because it matches one of those patterns. Again, this is fine. But when I look at the console here, I, I, no I noticed that it had these double slashes, which kind of suggests that the developer was just doing some string concatenation without any filtering or, or checking or invalidation. So 
I remove this slash and resend the request. And now you see the slash is gone. So now it's no longer double slash, it's single slash. Okay, if this is a string concatenation, can we do something like this? Can we go one level up and then go down to the web subdirectory? Yes, we can. And we can actually go all the way to the root directory and it still works. So now we have the relative path with dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, and we can retrieve any file from the system that matches one of those, that has one of those extensions, right? We still cannot retrieve something like password file because it doesn't match. Okay, but let's take a look what here one more time. The developer decided, decided to use the method find of C++ string. The method find looks for the substring anywhere in the string, not just at the end of the string, which means if one of these patterns appears anywhere in the path, then the match would be, uh, then, then we will have the match. So for example, if I put XML here, it's, it still doesn't work, but I don't no longer get 401 unauthorized. I get 404 not found because this file does not exist, of course. But what if the, this device had a path with one of these patterns um, a directory with one of these uh, extensions maybe in its name. And apparently one of the vendors had it. So I'm going to search for directory with a name that contains .jpg. And there is such directory. You see, it's a directory. And now I can take this and I can build a relative path with dot dot slash to any file on the system. Right? Okay. Now you see where I'm going. If I copy this and put it in my HTTP request. Drum roll, boom, I get the content of EDC password file. Awesome. Um, now I can read any file on the system without any authentication through this uh, HTTP request. And a more interesting file is called box.ini. It has some settings, including the administrative password. All right. That's a pretty big issue. Okay, what else is going on here? Um, upon further review, I noticed that this function has special handling for multi-part form data. And where is, and, and again, um, as I was analyzing logic, it took me quite, quite a bit of time, um, not just a couple of minutes, but I, I, I realized that uh, if the request has a content type of multi-part multi form data, it is served without authentication. Again, interesting. So where is this multi-part form data is used? There are two functions on the device that use that. The first one is logo upload. I can upload an image. That will be overlaid on top of my video stream. And if I look at the corresponding request, uh, let me again remove all the unnecessary headers and remove the authorization header too. When I send it, it still it still succeeds. Okay, so that's 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 an issue too, right? So anybody can upload logo that will be overlaid on top of the video stream. Um, well, it's an issue, but not a huge one. So I mentioned there are two functions. The second function that's using the form upload, and you won't believe it, but it's the firmware up update. 
um, basically, you can upload firmware without authentication too. So I'm ju I just gave it a very small file so I don't damage the device. It's not going to work, but the post request was successful. And I'm going to send it to repeater. Again, I'm going, I'm going to delete all the unnecessary headers, including the authorization header, and send it again. Of course, this is not a valid firm firmware, but the, uh, this operation was successful. Now, this is a huge issue. That means an attacker can push, can, can build their own firmware, push it to your device, and completely own you. The only problem is this operation requires administrator to reboot the system. And uh, so the attacker cannot um, execute code at will. They'll have to wait until the device is rebooted. Now, the question is, is there some other upload that will have the code executed right away without waiting? And the answer is yes. So um, I am going to look for, I'm going to use my favorite Ghidra string search and look for this string. I want to see where the file upload is handled. Here it is. It's in this one function. And I'm going to rename this function to box upload. All right. You can see that um, here is our familiar firmware update file. But when I scroll down, I can also see some, some other familiar names like load and logo and box.ini. And the other thing I saw was this UK Dakar. And I have no idea what this is. It's not in the documentation, but I, I guess it's maybe maybe it's a kernel update. So um, I searched for this one in the binary. Like where else do we use it? And I found it being used right here. And now, if you read this code, you'll be surprised. So we basically unpack this RAR file. We change all files to the executables, and then we execute uk.txt as a shell script. So if this uk.rar has uk.txt, it will be executed right away, right after the upload. And that's exactly what I did. So I have the uk.txt with one command. This command starts netcat. By the way, netcat is present on the device, which is very convenient. Um, and um, I can get a re uh, reverse shell. Now I need to package it to uk.rar. And now I'm going to do, let, let's be cool and not use the browser or burp, but use the curl command. So this curl command is um, sending a post request with, a, with um, form, uh, multi-part form, form data with a single parameter with the content of this file. And now if I look at the processes on the device, the netcat is there waiting for me to connect to it. And completely own the device. Great. So we have remote code execution of high severity. But this is not all. <laughs> we also can see that this uh, file uh, upload function has special handling for PNG files. If you upload that logo, it is converted to bitmap using an external utility called PNG to BMP, which has two parameters, I guess, input file and output file. And one of these parameters is completely controlled by the user. So when you do your logo upload, you specify the file name here. And I figured that um, by trial and error that it has to begin with logo and it has to end with .png, but it can have anything in between. So uh, my device rebooted because I did that netcat thing. 
So I need to tell that to it again and restart the program. So like I said, I can have anything between logo and dot PNG, including semicolon and the command. If I send this, uh, yeah, the console reports a few issues to me. Of course, foo, foo is not found. It's not a valid command. But what we know is found on the device is netcat. So I can put my netcat command here, send it to the device, and get my reverse shell. As you can see, this is what is was trying to execute uh, with my injection. All right. So uh, a bunch of high severity issues, but there was one particular class that I have not hit and I wanted to hunt for that specific issue because this program is written in C++ and unfortunately the code quality is not that great. So I thought it should at least have at least one buffer overflow. So I started looking for call, calls like sprintf that take um, input of format string and some parameters and try to put the, uh, put the result into a buffer. And I found several places where it is not used properly. The long story short, here is the function, one of those functions that doesn't do it correctly. So it has the format string and this, this variable, uh, this is actually a buffer on the stack of two kilobytes that receives the result of sprintf. Apparently this parameter right here is fully controlled by the user. RTSP is a streaming protocol that this device supports. And uh, it, it's, it's um, anybody can just uh, connect to this device and, and watch the streaming from it. So here is my um, payload. I send it RTSP command and I put this CSEC value, which is then reflected, which is then processed. And uh, this logic puts it back into this buffer and tries to send it back to me. So if I send it to this port on the device, port 554, it, the program crashes right away because it's a buffer overflow. Now, the big question is, can we get code execution? So I spent a couple of nights trying to figure that out and I came to the conclusion that it was not possible because of ASLR. Uh, but, you know, this is a denial of service and the, the, the whole purpose of this device is to serve video reliably. If an attacker can send a very simple command to the device and crash crash it, then uh, it's a big issue. So even if it's not remote code execution, the denial of service in this case is a big issue. All right. I hope you were all able to follow this. Now, I wanna put all these vulnerabilities in three different buckets. The red bucket contains the intentional issues. So somebody decided to leave a backdoor and somebody decided to leave Telnet open. This is red, this is unacceptable. Now the green bucket is, um, I believe are coding mistakes. You know, we all make mistakes and we need to learn and move on. But the unauthenticated firmware upgrade, I am not sure about this one. I like to think that it's a coding mistake, but something tells me that it, this one was intentional as well. Maybe so vendors could push the firmware to the devices without credentials. So I have no idea. But these devices are behind NAT and firewall, correct? Well, in my case, it was, but Shodan finds over a thousand of these devices on the open internet. Well, this is not a huge number, but I think it's significant. And many of these devices can still be vulnerable. So I decided to responsibly disclose my findings to the vendors and I contacted, I tried to contact some of them and I got no response from some of them. I got automated response from others. 
I got some human responses, not understanding what I'm saying. And I also got some threats. Um, somebody was thinking that I was trying to damage their reputation by doing this. And um, they mentioned legal action against me. And that was not something that I was interested in. So um, I talked to one of my ex coworkers who had uh, experience with responsible disclosure, and he suggested I reach out to CERT Coordination Center at Carnegie Mellon. So these guys help uh, security researchers like me contact the vendors, do a lot of legwork and help with, um, um, the, the, with the responsible disclosure process. So I, I'm super happy I work with them, highly recommend them. In total, I identified 11 vendors. Three of them I knew had issues because I had those devices. Um, and eight others were most likely had the issue based on what I saw on the internet, uh, like their firmware updates and everything. Only two vendors responded to CERT and myself. That's really sad. Meanwhile, I submitted uh, CV requests and got six uh, new CVs assigned. So uh, one day this got published. Two days later, Huawei came up with this public statement saying, yes, uh, we, we saw the reports of these issues. We make the chips and SDKs, but the software that had the vulnerabilities is built by downstream vendor, which Huawei has no affiliation with. Meanwhile, the register picked up this story. And several days later, one of the vendors called Opri issued the security advisory. And I'd like you to note the developer name. The developer is called New Orange, and now that backdoor password makes sense. And I also um, <laughs> wanted to highlight this. They, they call the backdoor maintenance password. Uh, first of all, they didn't even spell it correctly, but I, I disagree with this. It's not maintenance, it's backdoor. Anyway, fast forward 10 months, and I decided to try some of these devices again. I so I went ahead and borrowed a few of them and uh, to see whether there, there was any fixes um, or improvements. So one of the vendors had Telnet off, great, but the application was not fixed. So all of these path traversal and remote code executions were still there. A couple other vendors had application completely taken care of, so I could no longer reproduce my uh, the vulnerabilities that I found, but the telnet was still there with some trivial passwords. Okay, others, I am not sure. I looked like at firmware upgrades and some of them I saw recent updates and I like to believe that they were addressed. Um, but in general, this is a very difficult issue. You know, it's a supply chain which is complicated and there are lots of different vendors, lots of different names, and there's probably not a very good communication between them. So, and there is no way for them to notify their customers like me. Like if I just buy this device, install it, they, they have no way of telling me, hey, we have a firmware update, you need to do it. So it's a difficult issue. Okay, just a few things I want you to take away from this presentation. IoT devices are computers, and these computers get more powerful every day. And all computers these days run some kind of software that we may call applications. And we, as application security professionals, know how to find problems and secure applications. So let's do it. Because remember, this is the reality, right? Okay, you, if you want to read more, I published a detailed write-up on my blog, and I also published some exploit scripts. So if you do a pen test or come across one of these devices and you want to quickly check whether they're vulnerable, you can uh, try those scripts. And please contact me. I, I'd love to hear from you, and uh, I wish you good luck. And uh, thank you for attending this talk. And I guess we have time for questions and answers.